Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Elena Groß, a neuroscientist, PhD in clinical research, founder of Keto Swiss. One final big topic when it comes to metabolism is actually hormones. Several hormones um, of the so-called endocrine system, that's the whole hormonal system basically, also can help control rate and direction of metabolism and metabolic reactions in your body. So um, pretty much all hormone glands that we know of in the body are involved in metabolism. You may have heard of thyroxin, which is uh, released by the thyroid glands, and uh, that plays a key role in metabolism. If you have hypothyroidism, for example, your metabolism is greatly slowed down. Hypothyroidism is greatly sped up. So how fast and or slow certain chemical reactions in your body are going is dependent on the level of this hormone, for example. So if you have migraine, it might also be worth checking the thyroid levels because hypothyroidism slows down metabolism, which means that there could be an energy deficit in your brain as well due to that. And the fatigue and so on could also be caused by hypothyroidism. There's another gland that is famous when it comes to energy metabolism, and that is that of the pancreas. The pancreas you may have already heard of in the context of diabetes. It is what produces, for example, insulin, which is a um, hormone that helps determine whether your body's main metabolic activity should be anabolic or catabolic. And um, it also regulates a lot of the activities that happen after you've eaten. The pancreas senses the nutrients, especially glucose, in your blood and then releases the hormone insulin as a response. And that signals to the cells that they should increase their anabolic activities and that is important because you need to get the glucose out of the blood and into the cells. It also um, releases glucagon, which is basically the counteracting, the opposite hormone to insulin that is released when blood sugar is going low, nutrient senses are going low, fatty acids are going low, and that's basically the signal to turn on catabolism and release fat from your fat tissues and start breaking down um, fat tissues and energy reserves for you to keep going. Now, what does insulin resistance actually mean? Let's take again another useful analogy so that you understand in the first place what um, insulin resistance means and later see why this could have been adaptive at some point. Imagine glucose is your favorite takeaway food, okay? The taxi driver is responsible for delivering your favorite takeaway food. So it delivers through your door, your house is the cell. So you're very hungry. The bell rings, the taxi driver is there, you eagerly open the door, the takeaway comes in, you swallow it down, you're so hungry, you love it, but you're kind of satiated, not that full yet. The taxi driver rings again and still has your favorite takeaway with him. Now you're less hungry, but you still really love it. So you open the door, you let the takeaway in, you eat the second plate. Now you're getting kind of fuller, but when the taxi driver comes again with your favorite takeout, you open the door less quickly, but he rings a few times, you know, you may be hungry again a bit later, you take in your favorite takeaway, may have a bit of a nibble, may lie down. Now, when the taxi driver comes again and again, you're already full, but you have some space in your fridge, right? You may be hungry tomorrow, the day after, so you fill up your fridge with that takeaway, but at some point, your fridge is full, right? Well, then you may be giving some to your neighbors or your dog, but there's not much more space for you to really store the takeaway. It may be ending up on your floor, on your table, everywhere, but at some point you have so much takeaway that you really will not respond to the taxi driver anymore. You will not open that door because you really have enough takeaway in your flat already. This is insulin resistant. Insulin resistance means you're no longer replying to that doorbell. You're not letting glucose in because you already have so much glucose in your cell that you become resistant to the insulin trying to shuttle more glucose into the cell because you know there's no space. That's insulin resistance. That makes makes a lot of sense that you would no longer um, no longer answer. Now, what does the poor taxi driver do now that you're no longer opening the door? He's going to have to bring that to your neighbors, but they also have too much takeaway right now. So he's going to dump it in front of your door. Once he's done that, he's gonna dump it into the streets. Now, everywhere there's gonna be piles and piles of takeaway food. And this is also part of insulin resistance, which means that 
glucose will be accumulating everywhere, right? It will be piling up everywhere, it will be leading to high blood glucose first, and then it will start binding to certain molecules in your blood, such as proteins, and impair their functions in some way, because now these proteins have tagged glucose on them. This is really not a good thing. Over time, when the takeaway really is dumped into all the streets, it will actually lead to your arteries becoming clogged. And this can lead to, um, to type 2 diabetes, clogged arteries, and maybe a stroke later on. So it's really not a good thing. Now we're talking about a glucose transport inside and outside of the brain through the blood-brain barrier. It may be important to also quickly explain glucose transport that get glu gets glucose into the brain through the blood-brain barrier is insulin independent. But the neurons themselves, they have insulin dependent glucose transport again. So once glucose reaches the brain in order to get into the neurons, you need insulin again. And this is very interesting. For example, from an Alzheimer's perspective, we know that metabolism, deranged metabolism, is also at the core of Alzheimer's pathophysiology, meaning that there, some people say that Alzheimer's can be considered even as a type 3 diabetes, which is diabetes in the brain. Now imagine you always have elevated blood glucose in your body. The, some of the tissues in your body can turn insulin, insulin resistant, right? But into the brain, there will always be a high influx of glucose because there's no insulin to regulate this. Now, blood glucose in the brain can also be elevated over years. And this can cause brain cells to become insulin resistant. This can correlate with the insulin resistance of the body, but actually it does not have to. So you can have insulin resistance in the brain without having insulin resistance in the rest of the body, which I find also, again, fascinating. So if you ever hear, hear about type 3 diabetes, insulin resistance in the brain, you now know that there is insulin sensitive transport glutes in the brain when it comes to neurons. And that may explain why uh, there may be insulin resistance in the brain for Alzheimer's as well. And that is why ketone bodies can be such a good mitigation potentially, dietary mitigation, we really enough because ketone bodies are an insulin independent fuel source, means that they can get into those neurons that are insulin resistant and provide them with the essential fuel that they need, in addition to being uh, able to catch some of the free radicals in there, reduce inflammation, reduce hyperexcitability, and all the other beneficial things that ketone bodies can do. They can get into the brain insulin independent and they get into the neurons in an insulin independent fashion. And then that's why they can be at the rescue of migraine. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Elena Gross, a neuroscientist, PhD in clinical research, owner of Keto Swiss.